This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Welcome to another edition of Artists in the Chippewa Valley. I'm Karen Krause and we are happy to be on location today. We have quite the topic for you today. We are talking with Willow of Steel and Ink down on Water Street and we're talking about piercings and all kinds of other things which I don't know if everybody would consider piercings to be an artistic form of work but it definitely is in your genre and we're going to explore all kinds of facets about health and safety and the history of it and the future of it and where we're headed with piercings in our world so thank you for being on the show and thanks for letting us into your shop yeah thanks for having me so before we get too far into all of the serious stuff let's get into a little bit of the history of piercing because for kids growing up now and young adults I mean it just it's everywhere and it's like it was forever but how did piercing actually come about how did we kind of get started into this trend uh, piercing has been going on for centuries um, probably not as much in the US but in other cultures it's been going on for quite some time a few that started you know probably about 40 50 years ago where they it was still taboo, they were doing it with safety pens, no gloves. I mean, then tattooing used to be the same way, and so did, so did some of our medical industries. It's definitely evolved a ton, um, the, the things that we use as far as jewelry and our, our safety practices. Definitely, definitely advancements, um, and like Fakir and um, people like that, Lane Angel, and uh, people that I look up to as somebody that has done a lot for our industry. Um, they were the ones that really got it going. And um, it started more in the gay community too. So I mean, that I think that's why maybe it got the name that it did for starting out in the US. I mean, if you ask people, you know, 10 years ago, if they had the right ear pierced, they were considered gay mm -hmm. or uh, I've had girls come in here and say which side's the devil side on the ears, you know what I mean? And this stuff doesn't have A lot of stereotypes. Any, a lot of stereotypes and not only that, just people coming to assumptions about things that they don't understand, I guess. And, and really, piercings, tattoos, both of those things used to be part of a, a status symbol. I mean, it almost used to indicate your social status yeah. in a lot of parts of the world. And we're talking hundreds of years ago. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, um, we have evolved quite a bit because uh, I know there's a lot of people out there who aren't necessarily making $10 million a year, but they have piercings and it's not yep. really a status thing anymore. It's more of an expression of yourself. Yep. And I'm doing piercings on babies all the way up to, which I'd rather not, but I'd rather them have a safe procedure. You know, I'd rather them be able to make that choice all the way up to... I pierced an 86 year old lady the other day so and people wow. are finding out that it is safer to come to a body piercing studio to get some of these things done where it's been accepted to do it in a mall setting or at their home with a potato or a piece of ice or whatever you know and yep. to where I'm at here so it used to be the the cheapest way that you could get a hole in your ear yep. <laughs> was the way that you went and we also didn't have MRSA and uh, there's probably about a thousand different kinds of MRSA at this point and at, uh, as far as statistics that I know probably about half the p population are carriers or have this. Wow. And so you just never know. No known cure. So I mean. Do you have any estimate on what percentage of the population has a piercing? Uh, I don't have that. Okay. Exact, I was just curious. But, um, I mean, it started in the ears, I've, obviously. That was the most common, and now we've evolved to, I know what are you piercing here? What the, body parts are you piercing? The nose piercing is by far the most common piercing, I okay. guess. Uh, then probably, well, maybe the earlobes first. I don't see a lot of earlobes because, obviously, a lot of people think that the mall's still safe, so they go there, um, or, uh, or just with a piercing gun in general. Um, that... That, uh, all the other piercings that I do, I mean, I've done like 10,000 noses probably in my career. I've probably done about 40,000 piercings in my career. So, and I'm only touching a small percentage of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. 
that's a lot of piercings. It is. Uh, and I saw a lot of jewelry. Let's talk about jewelry. You made a good transition into that. Um, there are so many types of jewelry out there these days. And I know that one of the big trends, because it's cheap, is the acrylic. Yeah. But I've been reading and I've been hearing from people that acrylic is not really the way to go. I mean, that's a piece of plastic. It actually breaks down in your body and a lot of it's actually got toxins in it uh, and it can cause cancer, you know, and that's already been proven in some states. They already have warning labels on certain jewelry saying this is cancerous, this may cause um, birth defects in your child if you wear this or, you know, it's pretty extreme. So if you're spending the money on a piercing, you should probably spend the money on quality jewelry as well. Quality jewelry, um, something that a doctor would use rather than what my car is made out of. You know, we all see what cars, what happens to cars over time and they rust, you know, it discolors people's skins, they tarnish. I've seen people come in with green bellies or, you know, black noses where it's permanently stained, you know. Yeah, so. because it's not just, do you think, oh gosh, I'm just putting a hole in my nose, you know, and it's so tiny, it's just a tiny little stud, but mm -hmm. that can really have an effect on your body, your overall health, I mean, that gets into your bloodstream. Yep. It, it can be a serious thing and you have to take it seriously, not just, oh hey, I'm gonna go get my nose pierced today. Yep. There needs to be some thought in it. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, all you kids can hop online. I can go and go to the cheap catalogs too where you're paying, you know, pennies to maybe a dollar for each piece of jewelry. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons that that stuff's so cheap, you know. And not only that, we're sending a lot of our money out of the country by, by buying these products too. And as far as the jewelry that I get, I like to keep it here in the U.S. because, I mean, that's our, it's our country even. Uh, the local glass blowers, I get some of my stuff from them to, you know, help them out too. So, so what materials are you using? What um, do you stock in the store? I use F-136 implant grade titanium ELI. Um, I use uh, implant grade 138 stainless steel. Um, and there's a difference with stainless steel because stainless, or not stainless steel, but uh, surgical steel. Um, surgical steel, the people get confused because it says surgical before it, you know, versus um, my car is made out of surgical steel. So obviously that's not a good metal. When, when it comes to doctors, it comes to what the piece of metal is made out of, you know, what components were put into that metal and how it's going to react with the body. Um, I use niobium, which is a hypoallergenic uh, metal. Um, I use uh, natural like horns and bone, uh, wood, different exotic woods. Um, and that, that's only in healed piercings. Um, and then I do some different silver and gold plated brass. Um, but everything that I have here is good for the body and not going to cause any bad effects over time. Because a lot of these things, you're talking about things that you actually would find in an operating room. You know, if someone needs a knee replacement, yep. that's the type of metal that they're putting into their knee. That's exactly That's what, what you're I'm using. using. Yep. Versus, okay. like I said, what a car would be made out of or a tractor or something like that. Right. Okay. Um, tell me about some of the laws. I know that you have been a big proponent of actually getting some of the laws stricter. You know, you don't really hear a lot of business owners saying, I want stricter laws. Yes. Um, but when it comes to this industry, um, my understanding is that there is no actual federal regulation on the books. Is that correct? Is it coming down to states making these decisions? It's coming down to states making decisions. Um, as far as right now, we don't have to have a bloodborne pathogens. We don't have to have a CPR, uh, AD, or any, any training behind what we're doing. It just comes down to if that person lets you work in their studio or that person goes and opens up their own studio and just goes pays the money and opens up shop and starts working. So I mean there's no like, hey I, I need to get, or you need apprenticeship or so many hours, you know even with a hairstylist you have to put in so many mm -hmm. hours and spend so much money on school and you know and keep advancing and I think they even have to have their bloodborne pathogens. And I, that, that definitely should be necessary and 
we need to have people come in here and, and, and watch what we're doing, actually sit down with the procedure. Like I said, I've never, or I've never, didn't say it to you, but um, I've never had somebody come into my studio and watch me change my gloves or make sure I'm working with blood properly or, you know, is my stuff getting sterilized properly or decontaminated the proper way. So and these are huge issues. I mean, they even have issues in hospitals and they have millions of dollars to spend on making sure people are mm -hmm. safe and people are still coming out with MRSA and things like that. So um, so you are licensed though, correct? I'm licensed. You're licensed yes. to be able to do this. <clears throat> yep, and okay. I do go out and get my bloodborne pathogens. I go far beyond what I'm asked of, um, the way that my shop is and the, the education that, I'm, that I go through every year or so. Um, I've gone out to the Association of Professional Piercers conference and taken as many classes I possibly could fit in my bolt load. Um, I went out to Vegas and took in different, uh, you know, scarification classes and different body suspension classes. You know, going on working with suspension teams and going down to Dallas for the last like three years. So um, this isn't just a hobby for you. No, like, this, this is, is my life. this is your life. This yeah. is how you're making a living. You're supporting a, did you say a three-year-old son? Yes. Okay. So you're serious about this industry. You're yep. passionate about it. Mm -hmm. It's tough. I'm a single dad and I run my own business and I have high bills to pay being on Water Street. And, but I know it's, it's worth it and I'm, I am success, being successful and I, I know that I'm doing the right thing for people. I have my friends coming here. I got my family coming in here getting pierced. I wear my jewelry. I mean, I wouldn't want to put harm on any, any of them nor the people that have been coming to me for 10 years, you know, and, and really put faith in me and, and do my job as advertising, you know, like I don't even really have to advertise because that person had a good experience and that they, they've never seen me, you know, a lot of these people have never seen a shop like this where they walk in and somebody actually knows what they're talking about mm -hmm. and the metals and making sure safety measures are being taken. So what what do we need to do to have some more regulation and why why is this such an unregulated industry these days when it's so popular i think it's just tabooed a lot um in other states like california and colorado and where health inspectors are going out to conferences like the app where they have free training um i've seen that make a huge difference uh and they're the way that they're looking at their shops and they're not allowing people to pop up with no education and um, just uh, being there, you know, and getting involved with what's going on in the studios, you know. I think it's, like I said, it's just taboo to some people still and they, they don't think it affects them when it does affect them in one, one way or another. It could be their niece, it could be their daughter that, you know, runs off and just gets pierced, you know. At 16 years old, you can get your ears pierced. They could end up in a dangerous place and you're still responsible for them at that point and you should feel a little bit responsible. Um, I, I guess I'm not responsible, but people need to be educated a little bit more openly as far as doing things like this, being mm -hmm. on the news, mm -hmm. um, putting it in the health inspectors' faces in the state and trying to get them to come and do something about what's going on. People are getting diseases, MRSA, hepatitis, and I've walked into multiple shops where I've seen people touch their garbage cans, touch their sink, bloody sinks, putting blood in places where they're not supposed to be putting them. Um, you know, I, I'm just, it's, it's, it's basically like a hospital here, you know, it's not to that level, but we're dealing with blood and bad things can happen if blood aren't, isn't taken care of properly. So what are you doing to push the legislature and push the government to actually step in and start looking at this more seriously? Do things like this. Um, for the last probably five years, I've been at the health department pretty much begging them to, to step in and and, and go to these classes that I'm talking about and be involved with us and try to educate them as they walk through my door. You know, I don't want the health inspector to be like, 
Yeah, this place does it a little bit better. You probably won't see this in the rest of the town. You know, like as far as the way that my dirty and clean room are set up, the way everything's organized, um, the passion that I take behind it, you know, and it, it, if, if they need to know what we know to a certain level, because if they don't know, then they're not ever gonna know. It's like you walking in and saying, okay, I'm inspecting you. You know, wh how do you know what to look for? Do they right. have their bloodborne pathogens to be able to walk around and touch things? Do they have the, the training to be able to sit in on a piercing and know what to look for? Um, so you are in contact with the local health department and yes. you're working with them and they've obviously been in your shop or you wouldn't be licensed and you wouldn't be here. Yep. So obviously, you know, by them giving you the license to practice, they're saying that you're doing things well. Yes. So it's now just a matter of maybe getting the public involved and making them take a firmer stance or making them push the federal government to be a little more strict because we know there are places in the world that, that are still following the old school methods. I think that uh, we have so many huge issues in the world and in our country that it gets pushed aside. I, I, I think that they think that there's more important things when it, it is a huge issue. Like you said, a lot of people are getting pierced. This, is, this could be, you know, if somebody doesn't do their job right, somebody comes in, has hepatitis, you don't decontaminate your area properly. You do 20 piercings for the rest of the day, all 20 of those people have hepatitis, or even possibly even longer that, than that. Mm -hmm. so, Including putting your piercers at risk. And put your piercers at risk as well. Yeah. So okay. to even work in my studio, you have to have your blood board pathogens and be trained by me uh, working with blood besides that, because a lot of the bloodborne pathogens classes that we have to offer in this area are not directed towards our industry and can be looked over very easily you know it's you know hop online pay 20 bucks for a bloodborne pathogen certificate are you going to be any smarter at the end of that maybe maybe not mm -hmm. you know is it going to pertain to what we're doing maybe maybe not you know will they act and do the things that they've been taught maybe maybe not so. and speaking of all the equipment and the training that that you've been through um you know, I know that the five holes in my ears um, came with a piercing gun. Mm -hmm. Is there a piercing gun in your shop? There will never be a piercing gun in my shop. Um, it destroys tissue. I've seen p multiple people come in here with reconstructed ears from the piercing gun, uh, deformed ears, uh, sh shattered cartilage. Um, more more times than one i'm sure you've heard it where they've shot it into somebody and have to push it through the rest of the way because they didn't it got jammed or whatever or using it on other body parts that other than the earlobe which is still dangerous and definitely shouldn't be in a cartilage area it's not a sterile way to do piercings anymore you, you can't autoclave up a, a piercing gun and even one time use you can it'd have to be sterilized in a, in a manner and it it was designed to take cattle and somehow it evolved into uh, us using it I mean they're made a little bit differently but um, it's not clean the the piercers that are using them are taking like a half an hour class of a, a video and practicing on teddy bears um, and they use alcohol as far as like wiping down their station and stuff like that, which does not kill hepatitis. And I'm not sure about MRSA, but I know that alcohol does not kill everything. And that's why I use the stuff that I do as far as decontaminating my area. So like anything, it, techniques have evolved. We've learned over time that even though the gun may look like something that's high tech and nice and easy to use, Pass. It's not It's not the way to go. That's not the safe way to do it anymore. No, not at all. Okay. And it, you're pretty much not really putting the sharpest object through your ear. Some of them are shooting the earring straight into the piercing, so that's, that, that's placing a lot of trauma on that ear. And so needles? Needle, is, that, needle, is that what you're needles, using? Uh, needles are the way to go. Okay. It's going to uh, cut through there rather than blast through it. I mean, anybody seen, uh, that's seen somebody get shot or, you know, you shoot something and the front is just a little hole, 
all the back is all blown out. And that's exactly what that is doing to your body. And the reason that they even are able to not, they have absolutely nobody coming in and inspecting them because the ear is not even considered really part of the body in Wisconsin. Really? So that's that's how it gets, except, or it goes on, you know, so nobody's coming in. And even if, I don't know, like I said, we don't have it the best either here with our regulations, would it make a difference? Maybe. So what are the ages these days for uh, piercings? There's no age on the ear okay. whatsoever as far as uh, until you're 16 you have to have your parent but uh, after 16 then that, that kid is able to pierce his go and get a ear piercing of any sort, okay. cartilage, ear lobes. And with the cartilage you're, you're still growing with a lot of, you got a couple few years of growing you're doing cartilage piercings well your body's going to grow and depending on that piercing if you get an industrial bar in your ear um, that possibly could end up not being long enough um, or maybe it grows a little bit differently and that, I, that's kind of why I like people to be a little bit older even with navels and things like that because their body is just not fully developed I mean granted most of those kids are probably going to go do it on their bus or whatever and mm. that that kind of mm. or they're at their friend's house or maybe they'll get into a crappy shop that just doesn't really care about what they're you know they'll do anything to get that business so um it's a tough subject you know you don't you don't want that person to go out and do these things to their self but all i can do is just kind of sit back and educate them why not to right. you know tell them about the MRSA and 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 you're probably not going to get hepatitis from piercing yourself, but you still put yourself at risk of a staph and other mm -hmm. MRSA and stuff. So is 18 the age for everything else? 18 is the Naval age for and everything else. Tongue, eyebrow, unless, all unless of that. Unless you're with your parent, you can be 16, except for the obvious like genitals and okay. chest and stuff. Okay. Um, what kinds of questions should people be asking if they? walk into your shop off the street and they don't know you, they don't know your reputation, they don't know anything of what you do here other than, hey, I can get pierced. What kinds of questions should they be asking of you before they decide, yep, I'm going to do this? I think they should ask about the type of metals that we're using and, and be, I mean, they're going to have to have some education to know that. Um, know that they're getting implant grade metals put in their body, um, making sure that that piercer has bloodborne pathogens and that everything's being sterilized properly, either been through a statum, which is one of my autoclaves that works a little quicker, um, or else that's coming out of packaging right in their face. Autoclave, is that a cleaning that, machine? That heats and pressurizes to 270, 80 degrees and kills all living organisms. Okay. So, um, Nothing can live beyond that point. Okay. Not only that, I use test strips to make sure that um, that piece of jewelry didn't fail through that load because I use one in every load, especially like instruments and stuff. That's super important because if it doesn't kill everything and that strip doesn't and it fails, the the health department only has you do it once a month. So you have all those loads. In between there, that could be a possible, uh, okay. not a failure. So I use test strips to make sure that every single load is documented and know that that is all sterile in that package. So they should come in, they should be asking about what types of metals, they should be asking about your techniques. What other questions, what other two or three top questions should they have on their mind other than, you know, can I get a rhinestone or, you know, those, those basic common sense questions that have all to do with the image, what else should they be asking you before they decide? Um, maybe the experience of the piercer, um, how many years you've been doing it, um, who you've been, have you had an apprenticeship or, you know, look at portfolios and see nice work with nice jewelry and healed piercings, um, making, you know, does that piercer go out and get educated? You know, like I go out to Vegas, there isn't a lot of education out there for piercings. It's getting to be where there's more and more, but it's 
definitely changed my life um, going out and taking as many bloodborne pathogens classes as I can, taking as many uh, classes on technique, um, going out and hanging out in the community, having other piercers confront you, you know, mm -hmm. working with other people in the industry that are going to either know more than you or maybe you have something to give that other piercer. Is it a tight knit? community around here? I mean, do you know all the other piercers? Do they know you? Or is it I think pretty everybody cutthroat knows that, me. It's, that it's competing for business? I think as far as like a, a few hundred mile radius or farther, I think I'm, my name's definitely got out there. Um, well, I may, something? I may, <laughs> I may be a, a threat to people that don't do it right, and that's maybe why they, they get offended, you know, rather than Hey, maybe come and ask me. I've been doing this for ten years. What am I doing wrong? Or you know, message me, ask me questions, or mm -hmm. whatever. You know, that's how I learned. I went out and I hung out with as many awesome piercers as I could possibly get my hands on and suck them dry. You know, <laughs> their information. So you're just a sponge. Yeah. So people are going to come into your shop. They're going to get a great experience with a lot of different things. Um, you obviously know something about tattooing, you know about piercing, you know about kavadi, you know about a lot of those body art forms that are out there. Um, so I guess the, the theme here is check out his shop here on Water Street and learn more. And if you're going to get a piercing, since that's really the topic of our show, make sure you do your homework and make sure that you ask questions before you do it. Mm -hmm. Don't just walk and in. Don't, and if you don't have, if you have questions, uh, <laughs> and I was going to say, that's our perfect cue that we uh, are done. <laughs> Thank you very much to Willow, who's going to go grab his phone. Um, we really appreciate you joining us for Artists in the Chippewa Valley, and we will continue to explore exciting new topics in future episodes. Thanks for being with us. This program was recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.